departments investigating the possibility as hard as this is to believe that two of the alleged terrorists involved in what happened on Tuesday may have attended schools run by the U.S. military. Now, this is according to a senior defense official. The official uh, the, this official didn't reveal the names in question, so we don't know whom he's talking about or other specifics, such as what kinds of schools they may have attended. But the official said two of the names released on Friday by the Justice Department matching the names of people who had attended schools or courses sponsored by the U.S. military under a foreign military exchange program. Now, I should say that officials at the Pentagon are cautioning it's possible that these matching names are merely a coincidence or that the terrorists were using false identities. And, of course, we've been pointing that out on CNN all day long, that they may have taken on the identities of other people. Uh, Pentagon officials also wanting us to know that... Uh, military officers from many countries around the world attend these U.S. military academies or courses every year. So this is done all the time, but what irony it would be if it turned out that one of these terrorists uh, had been to school at a U.S. military-sponsored course. You're watching now in New York, streets of lower Manhattan, motorcade with the President of the United States. See some people uh, on the sidewalks there. Uh, don't know if those are civilians or, or firefighters, rescue workers. As the motorcade makes its way through the city, most difficult thing to uh, to imagine. And we've heard story after story. You have to be an inherently type A personality, a, a bullish sort in your own right. So you have to see that that what they mean. au Canada de la TSR de la télévision suisse romande à Genève de la RTBF à Bruxelles et les rédactions de euh, Paris c'est-à-dire les rédactions de France 2 contacts have organized these things this will be a plain load of people who have been as anxious as any to get to New York this week be some difficulty for uh, the construction workers there's a better picture of the of the smoke again and it really has started up Tony Blair over there being a cheerleader for us, and people, the, the Chinese, everybody seems to uh, um, the large SUVs that always accompany these motorcades, usually. TJ Rogers, the president and CEO of Cypress Semiconductor. We don't have a lot of time uh, with you, but TJ, thanks for joining us. Thank you. We're waiting, as uh, you know, sir, to see uh, President Bush uh, in, in the ground zero there. What does he have to do? You're quite a corporate cheerleader yourself. What does he have to do? Well, I think he's uh, doing what he has to do. He's showing great leadership. I think he inherited the right stuff from his father. Uh, he has to be. He has to be calm. He has to be precise. He can't be a cowboy. He, he can't uh, do actions that aren't justified. And then he has to lock in and do what he says he's going to do and carry it on through to the end. Uh, and, and so far, he's doing exactly what I hoped he would do. TJ, I mean, I was talking to my friend Shep here about this idea of trying to do something sooner rather than later so it has the maximum amount of psychological effect. Do you buy that, that he has to move soon, that time is of the essence? No. I, I buy that... that a year from today or two years from today, we need to look back on today and say we did the right thing. <clears throat> we can't go injure people that don't deserve it. We can't go shoot up cities and countries that don't deserve it. The bad guys need to get taken care of, but what that means is it has to be measured and precise. And I think with, I saw President Bush with Cheney and, and Colin Powell on his sides the other day, and it just reminded me that he's put himself together like Ronald Reagan did, an exceptional team of people to help him through this time. Let me ask you about this sort of... Uh unwritten rule, maybe creed among a lot of you CEO types, to start buying your company stock on Monday or at least to compel others to do the same. Is that true? I'm buying on Monday. That's Are you really? You bet. Is it un-American not to? No, I, I, I don't want to use patriotism as a weapon. One of the things I'm very concerned about right now is that the terrorists will get their way by forcing us to act in ways that aren't American. I never point the finger at somebody doing something for his or her company and say it's right or wrong. They have to do what they're going to do. I'm buying because it's right, right for us to do. I, so I'm it's more right now, TJ, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but it's more right now than it would have been last Monday or earlier Monday, the last trading day of this week. 
precisely because of what happened on Tuesday. Yes, I, I think the situation is generally right uh, for us. It, it's time, and therefore the, the particular situation says Monday morning you step up, and if, if, if it's falling, it's falling, you step up anyway. All right, and by the way, TJ, I love the shirt. That, Thank you. That's business casual, <laughs> TJ, right there. Where were you on July the 10th, Neil? Where was I in July? I must have been on vacation because President Bush visited St. Patrick's Cathedral in Ellis Island and I missed it. Oh, that was his last New York visit, Yeah, right? I forgot that it happened because I wasn't here. Sorry about that. You're not an encyclopedia. Darn close. <laughs> All right, T.J. Rogers, I want to thank you. Also, thank uh, you. I want to go to an interview uh, Britt Hume did a little earlier with uh, Ted Olson, the Solicitor General, of course, who lost his wife in that uh, plane crash, the one that rammed into the Pentagon. Let's listen to that. A face, a name, and a voice familiar to anyone who followed politics in America, especially on television in recent years, was that of Barbara Olson, a lawyer, a writer, an advocate, and also the wife of this nation's Solicitor General, Ted Olson. Ted Olson joins me now. Ted, um, your wife's name was the first victim's name that we heard from the crash at the Pentagon site, and I know that she spoke to you. Uh, I'd like to uh, convey on our on behalf of all of us here, our condolences to you and uh, our, our best wishes to you, sir. Thank you. Um, I think some of your viewers know this, but Barbara was on your program and Tony Snow's program from time to time, and she was she loved to be with the people here at Fox, and well, people were very kind to her, and well, I she very much appreciate lot, that. And we liked having her here. I, I know that she called you while that plane that had taken off from Dulles was in the air. Could you describe those conversations? Yes, there were two conversations. Um, the plane took off at 8.10 in the morning, or that's when it was scheduled to take off, and that's when I believe it took off. I had been in my office at the Department of Justice. Someone told me that there had been the two strikes that occurred at the World Trade Center. I turned on the television set in my office and watched, as I guess all of us did, this tragedy unfold at the World Trade Center. Um, uh, one of the gals uh, in my office came in and said, Barbara's on the phone. I picked up the phone. We spoke for a couple of, uh, maybe a minute or two she before we were cut off. It was clear. Um, it was cut off. And then a few moments later, we had another telephone conversation that lasted for three or four minutes. I was at first relieved to hear Barbara on the telephone because the panic strikes Immediately, my wife had taken off on a plane. Two airplanes had crashed into the World Trade Center. Uh, I, of course, like any other person, felt potentially devastated, I mean, panicky a little bit. And I made a calculation that it couldn't possibly have, that airplane couldn't possibly have gotten to New York, although it could have been close. But then to hear her voice was was reassuring and calming. But then her next words out of her mouth were that. Uh, uh, Ted, my plane's been hijacked. Was oh, she calm? She was very calm. Um, she was completely in control. Was of she her sort of emotions. whispering, or was she speaking? No, she was voice? speaking loud enough that I could hear. I didn't feel that she was whispering. I said, um, at, I, I asked her a couple of questions, and I'm not sure that now the sequence in which I asked those questions. But I learned from her that she had been in first class. She had been. The, she and the other passengers had been herded to the back of the airplane. I asked her whether they, the hijackers, knew that she was calling, and she said, no, they don't know. Um, uh, she indicated that they had used knives and box cutters to take over the plane. At some point, we got cut off. I immediately called the command center of the Department of Justice right. to let them know that I, my wife was on a plane that had been hijacked. I went, mainly wanted them to know there was another hij uh, hijacked plane out Underway, there. I didn't right. know whether anyone in... What, what did they say when you called them? Uh, they just absorbed the information, and they, they, uh, they promised to send someone down right away. Um, I didn't know that I was going to get another call. Um, and I expected them to pass the information on to the appropriate people, and I assumed that they did. Um, a few minutes later, um, another call came in from Barbara. I found out later that she was ha having, for some reason, to call collect. Um, and had, was having trouble getting through. You know how it is to get through a government institution when you're calling. Like correct. Call, right? um, but she managed. To, Barbara was Barbara was capable of doing practically anything if she set her mind to it. And uh, in retrospect, I'm not surprised that Barbara managed to get collect calls. You don't through. know whether it was on a regular cell phone or one of those uh, those air phones. No, I don't. Uh, and I first of all assumed that it must have been on the airplane phone and that she somehow didn't have access to her credit cards. Otherwise, she would have used her cell phone and called me, so I think that was probably what it was. 
But Barbara got through a second time, and we exchanged the feelings that a husband and wife were extraordinarily close as we are, th those kind of sentiments. Um, and she assured me everything was going to be okay. I told her in the first conversation that the two hijacked planes had hit the World Trade Center, and um, I've, I've, my impulse was that I had to tell her that that was the kind of person she was, that's the kind of relationship that we had. Um, I always wonder whether I should have, but she, her, in, her instinct was, what do we do? What do we tell? What shall I tell the pilot? What can I do? And I asked her where where she was, and she tried to tell me where she was and what direction the, she, the, the, the aircraft it's appeared to be to going. Tell. I think it's impossible to tell. You've, you've, we've all looked out the window, and we don't know exactly where we are. She said there were residences she could see, and she speculated that the aircraft was headed northeast, but I don't know whether that was correct or whether she really knew that or whether someone had told her that. Um, Did she describe the uh, hijackers or say no. what they'd said or anything like that? No, the only thing that she said with respect to that is that the pilot had announced that the plane had been hijacked. She said it had been hijacked shortly after takeoff. By this time, the plane had been in the air. I, again, I'm presuming that it took off on time for over an hour. Um, she implied that they had been circling around for a while. Not long after the um, second phone call, the connection was broken by what I don't know. I was watching television in my office um, both before, after, and during these telephone calls. I began to hear reports of the explosion at the Pentagon, and I knew in my heart that was that, air, uh, that aircraft. Um, and I also knew in my heart that she could not possibly have survived um, that kind of an explosion uh, with a full load of fuel on a recently taken off airplane. Um, I wanted it not to be true. Uh, I wanted it not to be her plane. I wanted it, I wanted if it was her plane to have somehow survived because she was back in the airplane, but we know that doesn't happen, not with those sorts of, now, sorts of things. At a time like this, um, how does someone like you with a relationship so close to someone who was so vibrant, how do you deal with this? Well, you, uh, you have to just take it one step at a time. You have to take strength from the people that love you uh, and the people that love Barbara and the huge number of his expressions of sympathy and compassion and support. Uh, that has been extremely moving. Um, the uh, calls that I've received from President Bush and Vice President Cheney, the fact that there are other people that are suffering every bit as much as I am, um, and that our whole nation is going through a tragedy together, I think we have to think about those things. We have to think about whatever positive things we can about the fact that there are people that care about us. There is a life to be lived. Barbara would have insisted that I live my life and then I go on and do the best possible job I could as Solicitor General of the United States. She would have, wouldn't she? What was always extraordinary to me about her, if you permit a, a personal observation, was that she was always in the middle of this political combat that has raged so in Washington in recent years, and yet every time I saw her, in every setting, on the street, on the air, everywhere, she always had this beaming smile. She was the most cheerful person I ever saw. Uh, I suppose a happy warrior is a fair characterization. Yes, and a, a person who was 100% involved in living life. She wanted to do everything. She was a professional ballet dancer. She earned money uh, at producing movies uh, and, and as assistant producer in movies and television commercials in Hollywood so she could go to law school. She, she paid her way through law school. It is until you see it um, on the ground, in the air, uh, in person, I guess, uh, that you get a sense of the the real magnitude of this. Martin Savage has seen much of it over the last couple of days, Marty. Well, I can empathize very well with the reporter that was giving us that full report, and even the President of the United States. I've spent a lot of time around Ground Zero. Your first impressions, where every sense in your body feels, sees, smells, even tastes the disaster that took place there is something that the television will never give to you. And it has an impact on you. It changes you. And it would be very interesting to hear the president's comments, having been there. There's so many times we have struggled, even as reporters, to try to give you words, to try to give you some verbal depiction to go along with the picture. And you can't. And I well, think when the president's there, 
he sees that as well. In the mean, meantime, we watch these fighter jets continue to provide cover overhead as the president walks below. One of the things about this, Marty, it seems to us, is that uh, in terms of describing what is left down there, the awful mess down there, uh, the pictures, whatever the limitations of television, and certainly there are some, but whatever those limitations, the pictures themselves still speak volumes, the smoke still rising. Uh, now on Friday, late Friday afternoon, speaks volumes. Judy? Yeah, Aaron, I'm watching the same pictures you are and wondering maybe you or Marty can help me uh, understand where the people are walking to tour. What is the relationship between that and where the the rubble is and, and where the, the human remains are? I'm trying to understand how is it possible to get close enough to look at it without being physically on top of it? Well, I, uh, Marty... Way Marty? in here too. Well, the, uh, first the, of all, let me tell you that I'm at a disadvantage that I cannot see on a television yeah. monitor exactly what you are seeing. But one of the things to point out, the areas where they have always felt that the greatest chance for survival would be people that are now underground. No matter how they got there, whether it was in the form of the collapse or whether they had been underground at the time or near uh, ground level and then collapsed into the ground. That's where they believe the chance of survivors are. The sub-basements of the World Trade Center are said to go down at least six levels, not six stories, deeper than that, six levels. Some of these ceilings are 20 feet high. So it is quite possible that there is an area that is being cleared out and prepared because that's where they feel most likely the chances are of finding. Uh, but I can't tell you specifically where the president is walking. He would not be walking in an area, though, where they have an active search for a survivor going on. But, Judy, as a practical matter, the, the damage is so broad and so widespread that wherever, uh, assuming the president is within uh, even a couple of blocks, and surely he is, uh, it's a terrible uh, scene down there, and it is not unlikely there are uh, victims of the uh, victims of the collapse still there. Uh, just picking on something, uh, picking up on something that Marty just said. There, uh, there is a tunnel uh, uh, that the path trains, the path trains are the commuter trains that run uh, between New Jersey and what was the trains, the trade center that was uh, uh, the the end point or the beginning point, I guess, depending which way you're going. And uh, crews from the other side, from the New Jersey side, with the Jersey City Fire Department, continue to work through the tunnel. Uh, they are hopeful, as Marty indicated, that, that that's, that's a natural air pocket and, and that perhaps uh, if they work quickly enough, uh, and it's flooded now, uh, but if they can work quickly enough pumping out, clearing away, working their way through it, there is a possibility, just a possibility, but a possibility uh, they may find someone alive, Judy. Aaron, we've also learned, uh, we've been talking about the many roles that a president fills at a time like this. He's keeping an eye, of course, on all the investigation. He's looking to the military front, to what our options are as a nation. He's touring. He's comforting. He's been comforting uh, families of those who are missing and presumed dead. We also find, uh, have been told uh, today, that he has proclaimed that flags throughout the country will remain at half staff through not just tomorrow, which I think had been the original plan, but through Saturday, September the 22nd, which extends this period of national observance, if not mourning, at least for one more week. And I will also tell you, I see that uh, CNN correspondent Jean Meserve has reported uh, in talking to Walmart and other stores that sell flags, that the sales of American flags have shot way up. Walmart reporting it sold 314,000 American flags just on Tuesday and Wednesday this week. In the previous two days, it had only sold 15,000. Uh, Kmart sold 200,000 flags. So the point we're making is that um, there is a burst of patriotism in this country. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty clear when we've been and we haven't had obviously much time to be out and about but when we've been out uh, we have certainly seen in new york signs of that uh, we saw an american flag in a restaurant uh, the other night uh, 
uh, some firefighters came in and they were applauded and serenaded with the national anthem or God Bless America. Um, it, it, it is one of those moments, too. The president is down touring in the area. This is tape of the president uh, as he circled the area around the Trade Center. He's approaching the area of the Trade Center. This would be the pool footage that uh, we're just now getting in. And this uh, took place not all that long ago, like perhaps a half hour ago. We lose track of time a little bit uh, these days. Coming into Manhattan. Um, well, that's a, that looks to me like this, the southern tip of the island. So we're just kind of wheeling around. And I would guess we're, there we go, as we zoom in, um, you see where it all once was. It's really, uh, to my memory at least, the first time that I have seen uh, the south tip of the island, uh, of Manhattan Island, uh, looking back at where the, where the Trade Center was. We have, all our uh, focus has been from the other side, from the north looking down, um, shot of the President's helicopter landing at a heliport uh, along the Hudson. And that's a scene live that we have all become familiar with too familiar with over the last few days, Judy. Well, Aaron, uh, we're going to, of course, keep our cameras trained on that area of, of South Manhattan where President Bush and, uh, uh, and other dignitaries are getting a, their first look at uh, the uh, rescue recovery efforts there. But today in Washington, the Justice Department, they were giving out more information on the suspected hijackers. Attorney General John Ashcroft released the names of 19 men suspected of hijacking the four airliners that went down on Tuesday. Now, all 19 of those are presumed dead, of course. Law enforcement officials tell CNN all of the men can be linked to suspected terrorist leader Osama bin Laden. FBI Director Robert Mueller described the efforts his bureau has taken to investigate the attacks on Tuesday. As of uh, today, uh, we have 4,000 special uh, FBI special agents who are working on the case uh, in various offices around the country and on various aspects of the investigation and we have 3,000 now Rita Hi, Neil. Well, investigators here are examining the three flight recorders that have been retrieved in the past 24 about five or ten minutes or so so um, this has been the drill for the last four days and uh... upon a Muslim country killing thousands, you will make 10,000 bin Ladens rise up in the stead of the one whose head you have cut off. The debate ended without a vote, allowing the Prime Minister to claim parliamentary backing for the government's handling of events. He'll spend the weekend in Downing Street, considering the next step. Kaxon, gabon guztioi dolusko, irudiak ekarri dizkigu gaurro munduak leku as... ...cheat on this man. He goes either by Abu Fatma or Dr. Abdel Muiz. He's Egypt's most wanted man, widely regarded as military commander and chief strategist of the militant Islamic Jihad or Al-Jihad. And he is the personal physician and close associate to Osama bin Laden. Now we also have a second uh, group and person that's being looked at uh, by U.S. intelligence agencies and frankly this name puts chills down the spines of counter-terrorists who work in this country. He is being looked at but has n not been connected that I know of or have been told but he I am told that he's looked at as one of the people that could have a connection. His name is Imad Mugnia. Imad Mugnia is well known in terrorism circles. This is not Imad Mugnia, actually. This is, uh, we'll take that off. In fact, only one picture in the last 21 years exists of Imad Mugnia. Uh, he was one of the original founding members of uh, Lebanese Hezbollah 
and up until this event that happened in New York and Washington, uh, terrorism experts say he killed more Americans uh, and prosecutors in this country than, than any other terrorist uh, in the world. He is responsible, they say, uh, with, uh, for the uh, U.S. Embassy bombing in Beirut, the Marine barracks bombing, hostage taking, bombings in Argentina, uh, bombings in Saudi Arabia, and uh, the list goes on and on and on. Now, a link between uh, bin Laden and Imad Mugnia came to light uh, back in 1994 when intelligence sources were able to discover that at an Islamic conference in the Sudan, bin Laden and Mugnia came together to talk uh, at this conference uh, in the night and that they believe some of the seeds could have been planted back then in 1994 uh, for what is happening now. Not the specific plan, but a general strategy. That's at least a theory they're working on or looking at right now. Now, more evidence of the bin Laden Mugnia connection came from this man you saw earlier, Ali Muhammad, who was a U.S. Special Forces uh, Sergeant. Uh, Ali Muhammad was recruited by the Al Qaeda organization and he testified at the trial of terrorists who were convicted of conducting the Africa Embassy bombings. Let's look at that testimony. I'll read it to you. He says, I was aware of certain contacts between Al-Qaeda and Al-Jihad organization on one side and Iran and Hezbollah on the other side. I arranged security for a meeting in the Sudan between Mugnia, Hezbollah's chief, and bin Laden. Hezbollah provided explosive training for Al-Qaeda and Al-Jihad. Iran supplied Egyptian Jihad with weapons. Iran also used Hezbollah to supply explosives that were disguised to look like rocks. Now this came in public testimony and it relates to terrorist activities up to the African embassy bombings, but that is a public link by a former member of Al-Qaeda between Mugnia uh, and Osama bin Laden. So that's something very important to keep an eye on if that pans out as a lead. I will tell you that I spent uh, some time in Beirut this summer, talked to leaders of Hezbollah because Hezbollah's name is brought up in that testimony. Hezbollah denies they have any intentions ever to attack the United States with any terrorism. They're very emphatic about that and I want to make that point clear. That's what they say. But these various links are being looked at in the intelligence community and there are a lot of links to look at, Judy. All right, Mike Betcher in Atlanta watching all these investigative threads and I would just, uh, one question that immediately comes to my mind, but I'm not going to ask you this now, Mike, is how, if, if they're coming up with all this information now, after the fact, why weren't we knowing about it earlier? But we're going to be talking to someone in a moment who can perhaps help us answer that question. Uh, at the Pentagon, uh, they're not only keeping an eye on the investigative aspects of this, they're of course also looking at uh, what are the next steps militarily. And for both of those angles, let's turn to CNN's military affairs correspondent, Jamie McIntyre. Jamie? Well, Judy, the Pentagon announced today, as we reported last night, that uh, the Pentagon has requested and President Bush has authorized a call-up of thousands of reservists uh, to back up some of the people who are flying combat air patrols over the United States and also providing disaster relief. Uh, each service, uh, the, the order is approved for 50,000 reservists to be called to active duty. Each of the services have reviewed what it is that they've been asked to do and identified uh, requirements so far for about 35,000 reservists. The breakdown uh, is about uh, as follows. The Army uh, is uh, planning to call up about 10,000 people. The Air Force, 13,000. Uh, many of those will be air crews and uh, pilots uh, for these planes that are flying, either flying over the United States, providing homeland defense, or on strip alert, uh, waiting uh, to be sent on a moment's notice to uh, take to the air. Uh, the Marines will be uh, at, uh, calling up 75,000 people, the Navy, 3,000, the Coast Guard, 2,000. They're going to be providing uh, everything from uh, port operations to medical support to engineering support. 
um, support of civil authorities, uh, even things like chaplains and military police will be uh, called up. And initially what they're doing is they're asking, the, uh, uh, asking for volunteers. You might ask, well, who are these reservists? And basically they're uh, your co-workers, they're your neighbors. Uh, they're my cameraman today, is in the uh, military reserve. And the head of reserve affairs for the Pentagon said today that they're getting an enormous response from reservists who uh, say uh, they are volunteering for duty. We've had people who are knocking on the doors seeking to help. They want to serve. They want to be a part of this. They're very emotional. We've had to say, wait a little bit. You know, it's, it's, we've only had a matter of hours since this all began. We're proceeding along the, uh, our way, and now we have the authorization to bring those people on board. Now, the way the U.S. military is structured today, it can't launch any major military operation without the help of reservists. That's part of the plan. But this mobilization is really geared more toward, uh, as I said, homeland defense, making sure the United States is protected from any future threats, and support of civil authorities who are engaged in disaster relief. If the United States uh, moves ahead with military action against uh, uh, suspected terrorists, that will probably necessitate another call-up of reserves. Judy? All right, Jamie McIntyre at the Pentagon. And Jamie, as you've been talking, we've been looking on the right side of our screen at the president's motorcade in lower Manhattan. These are live pictures of President Bush. We've been reporting to you about his uh, activities there as his helicopter landed at the southern tip of Manhattan. And he has been taking a, a close look at the recovery and rescue efforts underway there in the vicinity of the World Trade Center. But we're just beginning to get a sense of, uh, uh, you know, the enormity. In fact, none of us, we, you've been talking about this all day long, uh, Aaron in New York and my colleagues, just beginning to get a sense of the enormity of the devastation there in New York City. While we're looking at this, we want to uh, have, we have joining us someone who has been very involved at the Pentagon. Uh, formerly, she was the Deputy Chief of Army Intelligence she is retired Army General Claudia Kennedy. And uh, General Kennedy, I'm going to pose to you the, the question that I halfway posed to our correspondent Mike Betcher a minute ago. If we're getting so much information so quickly now about these, um, these suspected terrorists, why didn't we have it before? Judy, I think that um, part of the answer lies in the way we've been looking at the terrorist problem. Is it a criminal issue or is it a military threat and when you handle it as a criminal issue then what we do is we take a look at it through the FBI we gather evidence we try to build a, an airtight case for court but when you look at it as a military threat you look at it for early warning of impending attack and you try to destroy it before it comes at you. You're saying the threshold is lower. Is that it? The well, the, thre the threshold is lower for action if you handle it as a military threat. But what I'm saying here is that um, some time ago, I think we went in one direction, and that is to look at it as a criminal issue. We wanted to make sure we could bring these people to justice through the court system. And I think what's happened is the world has changed, and our approach probably at this point needs to be reviewed and say, do we still want to try to handle this primarily as a, a matter of uh, law enforcement, or is it now really a military threat that the military needs to deal with? Well, just as an example, in the last few days, we've learned that Osama bin, that the whereabouts of Osama bin Laden, we've, the United States has been looking at that for a number of years. Years. There have been several instances in recent years where people had identified, authorities had identified his whereabouts, but nothing was done. There was a report yesterday in the Associated Press at the end of the Clinton administration. Uh, they had a lot of information, but they chose not to take military action. What would it take to change that uh, approach, I guess is my question. Well, my thought is, like a lot of Americans today, um, that what happened on the 11th of September has altered our viewpoint about what terrorism is, how devastating it can be, and, and it is probably the beginning of some uh, thoughtful discussion about what it is we need to do in response to terrorism. I would say that um, we have got some superb people in the national security uh, policy area and in operations, and um, we need to go ahead and take a hard look at this. And I am sure that the president and his team of advisors is taking a very hard look at this even now. And you believe we're up to the job? I absolutely know we are. 
All right, retired uh, Army General Claudia Kennedy, formerly Deputy Chief of Army Intelligence. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Judy. I appreciate it. And now back to Aaron in New York as we see these pictures of the recovery effort. It's a, a New York Fire Department uh, a tent in the foreground there, and somewhere in the background we suspect the president is, and we're certain we'll get better pictures of this when the pool is allowed to get its pictures out. There's a very small pool with the president. Uh, quickly, we mentioned a minute ago that there was some effort to work through the PATH tunnel, the commuter train tunnel from New Jersey to the World Trade Center in hopes that there were people still alive and the tunnel officials now say that is off. There is nothing uh, to salvage. Correspondent Jeff Flock has been uh, working in the Midwest uh, the last couple of days. He was in Wisconsin uh, yesterday. He's in Dubuque, Iowa today, uh, taking the pulse of the country from that uh, vantage point. And he joins us now, Jeff. Indeed, Aaron, our uh, cross-country tour continues. This is a, uh, well, it's a window and door factory, Eagle Windows and Doors. Perhaps you've heard of them. Uh, this is one of the places, one of the countless places around the U.S. today that have been marking this day with moments of silence and other observances. And, uh, Darren, you were saying you don't want the president's job right now as we were watching uh, him tour. I couldn't imagine the feelings and emotions that the president has right now. Uh, I, I am so much with him in spirit and in faith. I really hope the best for him. You folks are a long way away here in Iowa, but you feel very much attached and, and connected to what's been going on. How is that? I don't think there's anybody around the country that doesn't somehow know somebody who knows somebody or have a direct relative who is in the area at the time to be affected by it. We're talking about the reserve call-up. I know you have reservists that work here with you. That's coming. Do you have fear about what's coming down the road now, the next step? that this nation takes? I think um, there's fear, but there's also just a sense of something's going to be done this time. You know, it's not going to just be washed away. We're, we're going to have to take care of it this time. Uh, this is we a tape you know. of the president meeting some New York uh, firefighters, New York police officers, some of the workers. This is tape we, uh, we got back just a minute ago. Jeff will allow uh, your conversations to go on while our viewers also watch uh, the president as he works his way through uh, this group of rescue workers. Look at, the, look at that face, how tired uh, that, that young man looks his tour today. Do you feel good about how the president has reacted to this so far? I think he's reacted very positive and I think that the whole U.S. is behind him along with underlying nations and larger nations overseas. I think they're all supporting his actions. As we watch the president in New York talking to the people that are firsthand having contact with this, a rescue effort, what is his next step in your view? What should his next step be? Just keep visible, keep assuring us that things are going to be okay. He's doing everything that is possible. Uh, just be himself. Right now, he hasn't gone, you know, like in a bunker and hidden. You know, he's been out there right there, and he wants to be with us. How do you rate How do you rate him so far? I think he's doing a very good job. I really liked his speech the other night to the country, um, as well as, um, you know, just the support of the prayer vigils and that sort of thing, being in support of that and coming down to New York, which I haven't seen yet. Um, but We're watching it now on the air. Right, but be invisible to the people. You said it's a tough job. Nobody wants it in a time like this. Is he the right man for this job? Oh, I think so. Very much so. He's, uh, I think, done a, a, as good a job as he could do over the past eight months con considering what he's had to deal with. And I think that uh, he'll come through shining just the way every president of the United States does. The nation coming together. Aaron, the latest from uh, Dubuque and our cross-country tour will continue, and we'll continue watching. You Jeff, thanks. Thank you very much. We continue to look at tape of the president. We see, uh, uh, and this is tape, we see uh, New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani just off the president's shoulder there. This is tape that the pool shot uh, just a few moments ago. Um, you know, it gets a little difficult here identifying rubble, to be honest, but I do believe that's an area that we have been able to see uh, as he moves, giving a thumbs up to some of the rescue workers. Again, that's uh, Governor uh, Pataki, the New York governor, off to the president's on the left side of your screen. Uh, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and obviously an official with uh, New York's bravest. New York City Fire Department. Okay. Certainly no one would quarrel 
with that this week, would they? That they are New York's bravest. Some 200 firefighters still missing in the rubble. Uh, this is, again, a uh, tape shot by the, a very small pool of reporters that have been allowed to travel uh, with the president today. Some of that has to do with security. A lot of it has to do with the fact that the president was very insistent that his visit be at, at worst minimally disruptive. Any presidential visit anywhere is disruptive. Richard Roth is uh, down on the ground. Richard, come on in. Yes, Aaron, work, work is going on right, uh, very near the president. Uh, you can see uh, torches, uh, sparks, as uh, what's left of the pedestrian bridge to the American Express uh, corporate building uh, is being brought down. They've been working on it uh, for the last few days. Uh, it's one of the structures that's uh, still been left up. Uh, I want, also, one can uh, help noting that at this time in Wall Street, for the thousands of people in the World Trade Towers, this would be a very joyous part of the week. The stock market would have just been closed. It was Friday afternoon. And usually Wall Street in this area, Wall Trade Center, has been often called a ghost town on weekends, though more people have been moving down here of late. And uh, as we've noted over and over, it is now a different type of ghost town. You have these giant buildings uh, hulking over the president and his entourage uh, in lower Manhattan, and they're just dark, no power. Some are structurally weakened, uh, their fate unknown. And uh, Friday afternoon in New York, uh, not the way it used to be. No, it's certainly not. Uh, just uh, helping identify some of the other people there, we see a New York Senator, uh, Charles Schumer, uh, facing uh, the camera, basically. Uh, um, and off to the left there was Joe Alba, the FEMA director, a longtime uh, friend of President Bush's, and he named him to run the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Again, this is tape shot by the pool. Um, is Elizabeth Cohn available here or not? Yes. Okay. Elizabeth, uh, have you seen any activity? Is the president going to make his way to the armory? Unfortunately, Aaron, I, I have no idea. Okay. Okay. Uh, Elizabeth uh, has been, uh, we see Senator Clinton, Senator Hillary Clinton, getting a kiss on the cheek from uh, Mayor Giuliani there. They were almost, uh, almost ran against one another. Kelly Wallace, uh, uh, will the president make his way to the armory? Well, Aaron, we don't know, again, because the White House keeping everything under wraps a little bit, but we do know that he is expected to go to another location after this one. So uh, we don't know what that location will be, but we do expect him to go somewhere else after spending some time with firefighters and police officers. And I just wanted to bring up something I learned earlier this afternoon that I don't think had been, has been reported just yet. You see the president there uh, alongside Senator Hillary Rodham Clinton. I was speaking to former President Bill Clinton spokeswoman earlier today. Of course, we know that the former president, along with Senator Clinton, attending the National Prayer Service in Washington, D.C. And to show you how this really hits home, apparently, according to the spokeswoman, Chelsea Clinton was 12 blocks away at the time of Tuesday's attack and that she apparently has a friend who was working in one of the towers, one of the Trade Center buildings, and that she and her friends joined countless other New Yorkers racing away from the downtown area wow. shortly after 9 o'clock in the morning. And uh, apparently, according to the former president's spokeswoman, you know, the President Clinton hearing about this, obviously concerned, but he was a father first and foremost. He was concerned about getting in touch with daughter Chelsea. He couldn't get in touch with her for a while, and he was most gratified when he was finally able to uh, talk with her. And then, of course, we know that the former president was in Australia, made his way back to New York, and that he and Chelsea decided, as New Yorkers, according to the spokeswoman, they wanted to go down to the area and talk to New Yorkers and try and do everything they could to comfort those people grieving. I thought that was rather extraordinary. Again, it shows you how this really hits home. That's that's remarkable. I, it's remarkable uh, that it happened, and it's, it's frankly, I think, somewhat remarkable that we hadn't heard it uh, until this point, given uh, how much is out there. Uh, Charlie Rangel, congressman uh, from Harlem with the president, and then just in front of uh, uh, Mr. Rangel, uh, Jerry Nadler, also a congressman from the Upper West Side of, uh, I believe that's right, the Upper West Side of uh, Manhattan. Um, 
it, it's as you would expect it's all very cordial these are not political moments uh, New York City is a very democratic town um, and voted heavily Democratic in, in the election, as did the state, but uh, this is not a political moment, and the entire delegation is certainly welcomed with the president uh, today. And Aaron, a very Democratic town and a Democratic state, but with a Republican mayor and a Republican governor. Yes, indeed. It is a, a Republican mayor, uh, but, and if you think back, all those what seems like a lifetime ago in many ways to Tuesday. Tuesday was election day. Mayor Giuliani is uh, ending his term. Term limits uh, make it impossible for him to run again. And so it was election day to begin the process of choosing his successor. That election was canceled. And I, I saw this morning it's now been rescheduled. And that is the difference now, Neil. Pakistan also, they've been our friend. They've been with us on some things, against us on many others. City, some who may or may not even have been here before, but have come to take part in this effort because uh, this is this is not a uh, this is not a New York tragedy. This is a national tragedy. Back to tape. Uh, we're switching it. And Emma, after this presidential visit, um, which I know both the mayor and the governor, and I'm sure most people in New York would welcome, um, it's then back to a weekend of some hard work because.